Today, I'm going to uh, go over a, a passage that's probably very familiar with many of you, and it's probably one of the most well-known in the Bible. So in some way, I think it's also quite timely, because these days, we actually do know who is our neighbor very well, maybe all too well. Why? We all know that if any one of them in your building got covered, <laughs> you will be notified and swift action has to follow depending on the number of cases it can range from cleansing mandatory testing monitoring evacuation or even lockdown for days uh, we will meet on many of them in the queue for mandatory testing which can take hours actually a student of mine has waited for eight hours and nowadays is not a pleasant sight with the cold weather and rain. So, however, today the passage gives us a very different take on who is my neighbor. So, in the passage we just read, Jesus was in a tricky position. As in those days, he's constantly under the scrutiny of the religious elites. However, when you try to test Jesus, you are the one who end up getting test. So do think about it twice. The expert in the law start with seemingly a very innocent question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You may recall the same question has been raised by a rich young ruler and mentioned in three other places in the gospel. The rich young ruler genuinely want to know the answer. And Jesus has not been ambiguous about that. But he just gave him the answer he doesn't want to hear. But it's different in this passage. Jesus knows the intention of the scribe. He doesn't really want to know the answer. So he responds by asking him a counter question instead. Jesus has asked specifically what is written rather than their oral tradition, and in particular, how the law expert interpreted. And uh, before, during worship, we have gone over about loving the Lord. And in fact, Jesus seems to be the first person who really put the two together. And this scribe has been very familiar with Jesus' teaching and answered very precisely with the great commandment. So as you know, from the Old Testament, in fact, these two parts come from different origin. The first part, love the Lord, come from Deuteronomy chapter six. And the second part about the neighbor come from Leviticus chapter 19. But one point I want you to note here as you have seen, I highlight the do in the first question uh, in red, because in the original text, the tense he used here is quite different from the do uh, from Jesus' answer, which I also highlight in red. The first one, they use a tense called aorist participle, which in prime, just one single action will be a sufficient qualification. more pointing to a way of living with faith expressed through love. So in a subtle way, Jesus has refined his question. To love God and your neighbor is not something you do to achieve an end or being qualified for eternal life, but much more a way of life to live out. Although Jesus seemed to be satisfied with his answer, his objective to test Jesus and review his inadequacy is not satisfied. So he went on to ask, who is my neighbor? In fact, this is not a trivial question because for the Jewish people, neighbor is quite narrowly defined. Usually it only includes themselves, especially among the Pharisees. They don't even include all the Jews, but only those abide by the law. So it's quite clear and quite exclusive. So the question is tricky 
in case Jesus answer may include some people who are not acceptable or even repulsive to this religious elite. And Jesus is going to do exactly that. But he is very wise. Instead of giving him a definition, he gave him a case study which led him to derive his own answer. So, since Jesus is actually heading towards Jerusalem, so he talked about a situation they can all easily relate it to. As you can see in the picture, that's exactly the road that is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It involved a descent of 3,300 feet, and the whole journey is about 28 kilometers. Could be a day's journey. Uh, but the story is also credible because the road, this road is known to be quite dangerous with robbers. Many people still take it because it's shorter than another safer road. And also Jericho is quite known to be the abode for many priests and Levites. So the man obviously is not in, group, uh, in good shape after being attacked by the robbers. So in this story or parable, there are three other characters and their respective response are also described. As I have highlighted in green, these three characters is a priest, a Levi and a Samaritan. They have an action all three of them share, which I highlight in red, saw. They all saw the same situation, but their response is a huge contrast. For the first two, although they are highly re uh, esteemed in their society, uh, they are the religious elite. But they saw the man they passed by on the nation. Not only they ignore, but they deliberately try to dissociate themselves from it. Although in the parable, it's not revealed why they do nothing. Uh, in some of the commentary, they speculate they may fear also for the robbers because this is a role that are known to be dangerous. And they may be concerned if they stay around, uh, this man can even maybe the bait for the robbers. And on the and other reason is because they may not want to be defied that because once they touch uh, some dead people that may prevent them from performing religious duties. However, we regard this as being doubtful because they are journeying away from Jerusalem. Um, it is actually meaning they have just complete their temple duties. And also even priests had an obligation to bury a neglected corpse. But however, because the priests and the Levites, they have been accustomed to being evaluated on the basis of their ancestry, ancestry and not on the basis of their performance. So maybe these are not the things that is very high on their priority. And the inaction and high status contrast sharply with the Samaritans' action that's ground in compassion and really beyond what moral obligation is required from such an outcast. As you all know, they are despised uh, by the Jewish people and always like to keep a distance. And this hero is so unlikely and surprising. It's almost like I think a lot of you may have watched the script game. But again, at the end, the winner seems to be so surprising. He seems to be a gambler, a loser, a divorcee, deeply human, but not something that usually we emerge with people who are competent with a lot of resources. And the Samaritan is probably a frequent traveler and well equipped. So first he gave the man first aid, put him on his donkey and bring him to a safe place to recover. He did not stay there till he gets well. He just made sure the man was being taken care of by seeking help from the innkeeper and promising he would return and play up. Then he went on to his journey and carry out his own business. 
Renowned organizational psychologist Adam Grant has talked at great length about the art and science of give and take. The Bible has only asked us to love our neighbor as ourselves, but not more than ourselves. So the Samaritan has taken care of the man to ensure he can get back on his feet, felt comfortable asking others like the innkeeper to help while not neglecting his own duties. And contrasting the two deeply religious and highly moral men who ignore the injured man and walk away. How is this situation any different from today? So I want to share a story with many of you. You may have heard of this story of Little Yu Yu, Xiao Yu Yu, which happened in 2011, about 10 years ago. Xiao Yu Yu was a two year old girl playing outside her parents' shop in Fushan, Guangdong. She was ran over by a van, and actually twice, once by the front wheel and second time by the back wheel, as you can see on the second top picture from the left in the middle. And what is shocking is that after that, 18 people have passed by. And as you can see on the top, the picture on the right, this man walked past just literally um, less than one feet. She was crying and, and obviously hurting. But 18 people passed by, ignore her without stopping. Some actually walk the other way, like the priest and the Levi. Until she was found by the 19th pass by, you can see in the bottom, actually before that, she was run over again by another truck, as you can see in the bottom middle picture. And the 19th person is a scavenger lady, surnamed Chen. She heard the crying and smelled the blood, and she took her away and tried to seek help uh, from the people around and find her family. But unfortunately, Xiao Yue Yue was too severely injured and died a week after. And this has sparked an outcry in China. And many people have asked what happened? What's going through these 18 people's mind? How can they ignore the sight and cry of a suffering girl. And a lot of people have cited the phenomenon of Pongzhi in China. I don't know whether you guys have heard of this term. Pongzhi in Chinese is bumping porcelain. And this is a practice of crooks placing very expensive, fragile items in places where they may easily be knocked over, allowing them to collect damages when the items are broken. So in China and even in Hong Kong, as you can see in this slide, this is an actual case in Hong Kong that's happening. Some guy run over to a car wanting to pretend to be hurt. So in people in China is very concerned. If you stop to care, you may actually be uh, uh, held responsible. So in, 19, in 2017, China has passed the Good Samaritan Law to encourage bystanders to assist without fear of being sued or prosecuted for unintentional injury of wrongful death. And it is also discussed for the same to be introduced in Hong Kong. This is also a law quite common in the Western countries. Now let's look into the lady who came to rescue. And as you can see, her she is really a scavenger, um, a migrant worker from a nearby village. And for the many people who knew her, they are not surprised by what she has done. Although she's uneducated and obviously unsophisticated, she is widely regarded as being a very helpful person, straightforward, and she probably sprang into action precisely. She didn't think or ca calculate too much. She did it simply uh, from her instinct and compassion 
It's more a disposition without any premeditation. In fact, she disliked all the attention toward her after the incident and declined all the awards going her way. She just doesn't, she just want to help without thinking what she's going to get or what kind of recognition she will have. Again, like the Samaritan, the hero is always someone totally unexpected. And in some way, she's also a social outclass, not, not even belonging to Fushan. I don't know whether any of you have heard of the Good Samaritan Experiment. It's a very famous study uh, investigate what is really impacting or influencing, influencing people in their helping behavior. So the experiment involved uh, some seminary students are recruited and they are divided into two groups. One have to give a talk on the career opportunities and the other on a sermon for the Good Samaritan, like what I'm doing today. So each group was asked to travel to another building to give the talk. And on the way, they encountered a man slumped in an alleyway, clearly suffering. And each group was also further divided into three groups with in you must go now. The other two group is all you have some time to spare. So the outcome had actually indicate hurriness is a major impediment for anybody who want to give help. In this particular experiment, only 10% of the high hurry group uh, stopped to help the man, but for the low hurry group, 63% of the people stopped to help. And the result also shows there's nothing to uh, do with the, the kind of talk they give. The one who gives career opportunity has no different from the one who is giving a sermon on Good Samaritan. So that's very interesting because actually what you have in the content seem doesn't really translate into your behavior. And maybe people's cognition was just so narrow by hurriness they fail to make the immediate connection of emergency. So the results seem to show that thinking about the norms does not imply that one will act on them. Maybe in these days, ethics become a luxury as the speed of our daily life increase. So I should really be careful. After giving this sermon, does it really give a difference in my behavior? So going back, coming back to Hong Kong now, I don't know whether you guys see this piece of news on Friday. It was circulated in one of my chat group and I observed very diverse response. Some immediately come to ask more and want to donate and want to help, while the others are extremely afraid of. Uh, and also in terms of how they were talking about how we'll, we'll respond if we find out our helpers uh, contracted uh, COVID. So this made me to think, other than hurriness, what really prevent us from helping? Is it fear? Because some of these workers are kicked out of their houses once being found testing positive. The employers are so afraid of getting affected you can say the same about the priests and the Levites, as I just mentioned. One of the reasons they don't want to help is because they imagine maybe other robbers will appear if they stay any longer. And the injured man can even be a bait. However, fear is irrational and can go out of proportion. We all have to assess our own situation. For example, of course, if you have your booster with no elderly at home, you certainly have much less to fear and a much position to help. But even so, there's actually many ways we can mitigate our fear or concern. However, most fear we know that is not about life and death, but much more about trouble or just inconvenience or simply a lack of compassion. As you, some of you may know, the original meaning of compassion is co-suffering. Here, I also would like to share a good Samaritan story in our city, a story of 
compassion and co-suffering. Maybe some of you, many of you have heard of Mother's Choice. Uh, some of you may have even volunteered uh, or supported. It all started in 1986. A series of newspaper articles pointing to the alarming numbers of teenage pregnancies in Hong Kong deeply removed two couples. The picture on the top right, as you can see, one of the couple is a missionary and the other are uh, just in business. Despite having young families and limited resources, they quickly roll up their sleeve. With their heart for service, love for the city of Hong Kong, and they support from and the support from many in the community, they opened the doors to Mother's Choice in 1987. The passion to provide loving, non-judgmental support to the many pregnant teenagers who had no one to turn to. And Mother's Choice then quickly expand to provide nurturing care to children without family and become a voice for them to be in a family. They recall fondly at the start, they were stirred by the sight of these pregnant teenage girl and started praying, exactly like the Samaritan. When he saw him, he took pity on him. And after a year of praying, of course, that's what missionaries are best at. The business couple start to ask, we can't just pray. What can we do? Then they sprung into action really without knowing much what to follow. When the business couple Moran started Mother's Choice, they are an ordinary family with little resources. The wife even had difficulty in conceiving babies herself. However, in the course of trying to find home for the girls and the babies, their household also grew to have seven children. The eldest daughter, Alia, was only eight years old. Then, but Mother Choice has become a family ministry. The kids had been growing up serving there, though Alia was trained as a lawyer. When Mother Choice was looking for a new CEO in 2011, she felt compelled to apply, and after a six-month selection process, she became the CEO. With her legal background and youthful energy, Mother's Choice has certainly extended its service and scope to a new level. Today, Mother's Choice has also grown from the initial service offered to pregnant girls to night service as they continue their journey of a good Samaritan. The egg services range from remedial to prevention, from short-term intervention to longer-term solution. And over 30 plus years, they have cared for over 3,000 babies, served 55,000 girls, and welcomed over 9,000 uh, volunteers, changed over 3.7 million diapers and provide 1.7 million bottles of milk. Who will know just when they respond to their heart, the vision, and this uh, service, this ministry can serve so many people in our city. Their vision is putting every child in a loving family. And they, own, they understand only family, a safe, loving, and permanent place can really change a child's life. And most importantly, they don't think they can do it alone. They want to join hands with our community and everyone can be part of it. They show us how everyone can become a catalyst for God's work and his heart for our city. And today, despite the cosmopolitan image of Hong Kong, one in five children in our city still live in poverty and tens of thousands of children are at risk for neglect, abuse and abandonment. Alia has not only followed the parents' footsteps in Mother's Choice ministry, though she was also told not to be able to have children before, she went on to have seven children with six boys and one baby girl, completing the family with a perfect number. She said they never have enough, 
but they are committed to practice biblical hospitality. As a result of working in the ministry and raising these children, they also have to sacrifice their own lifestyle. Recently, they have to give up their apartment and move in with her mother. When they see needs and problems, they never expect someone else to do it. They always ask, what can we do? So now I just want to finish off the passage with a climax. When Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Again, Jesus is not providing the answer here. The expert in the law can't bring himself to say the Samaritan, though that's the obvious answer. The sheer mention of the term is repulsive to them. But ironically, that led him to say something even more profound. Though unintentionally, yes, it's the one who showed mercy, the one who showed compassion, is respective of his national, ethnic, political, social, religious, or economic status. Jesus has turned the table, twisting the original yet improper question, who is my neighbor? The original intent is who should qualify to be my neighbor and worthy of my love into a proper one. What must I do to be a loving neighbor? Jesus countered the question, indicate that we should worry less about who's a neighbor that should be included, who is in my group and who is not, but much more about being a neighbor to whoever we saw or come across in our own life path. Laborly love has been concretized in the care offered in this story, in this parable, by a social outclass, and also in the story of Xiao Yue Yue, a scavenger who, does, who didn't really even belong to the city. But, but, but their compassion has been shown by the uncalculated disposition of their possession, of their time, of their resources. During the darkest moments in Jesus' time, when John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the great prophet and beacon of hope for the Jewish people, was put in jail, about to be executed. Even he started to doubt if Jesus is the promised Messiah who will deliver his people. How did Jesus reply to his messengers? He reminded them to see and hear what he's doing. In this very dark time of our city, sometimes we do have doubt if Jesus is going to deliver us. How do you think Jesus would reply to us if we ask him? I think he will remind us his ministry continues. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed in our place, covert be cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor, both in spirit and in possession. Have you seen or heard? And in fact, you are invited to his ministry by being a good neighbor. Like the man on the road to Jericho, many of us are going down the path of life, attacked by covert and related disruptions or other disasters that's out of our control. Many of us are stripped of jobs, security, relations, feel beaten and mentally distraught, left half dead. We all need a Samaritan at times in life, and we can certainly be a Samaritan to our neighbors in, our in other times. How? Can you be qualified to be a good neighbor? Nothing much. We have seen the Samaritan can do it. The scavenger can do it. I'm sure you and I can do it. It can start just with a phone call, a visit, or even giving hand to any church organization that are already helping. 
I know many of us are busy or fearful, but our situation can only be worsened by inaction. Once you take the first step to be a good neighbor and to care, the door to a full and eternal life is open for you. So let's all answer and respond to Jesus' invitation. Go and do likewise. Thank you and bless you all.